Hey, this is Dave from the Carriage Innovator team and welcome to the April edition of Tips and Tricks. Today, we're going to get started with the Community Spotlight showcasing some great examples from users like you, uh, especially a first-time user of Character Animator and After Effects who's using them to make a children's web series. A pretty interesting story there. Then we'll move on to some quick tips and tricks. How to deal with handles and tags and the relationship between the two and how you can manipulate them to do some pretty cool things. Then we'll do some best practices with arm and hand recording, uh, and then we'll show, show how to do a simple shadow in After Effects. Then we'll do a fun experiment with kids. How to get a kid to draw a picture of a character or monster or something, and then turn that into an animated character animator puppet. I got my five-year-old Cameron to help me with that, so it should be a pretty fun uh, little session. And then we'll end with a drawing tutorial. Um, how do I go about the process of drawing a character animator, some of these example characters that you've seen before, my process of uh, each step that I take, and I'll take you through the process of making this Bluebird character and uh, how I did that. So uh, that's it for this month, so let's get started. So last month our friends at Digital Puppets had that uh, 3D mask that they created and uh, brought it into Character Animator and looked really cool. This month uh, they're back at it with more 3D stuff. Uh, they're building these things in Lightwave actually um, and then exporting it into Photoshop, slicing it all up and putting it together to create these really cool 3D uh, looking characters. So uh, this, this squirrel is for a YouTuber named Funny Squirrel For You who does uh, commentary over squirrels, videos of squirrels doing ridiculous stuff as squirrels do. Um, and it's a great character. I love how the tail moves in the back and you can drag the hands here. Uh, a few interesting things they did though, um, there is actually a draggable hand version and then a triggered hand version. Uh, so the user has an idea, can use either one. So if I press A, it switches to a triggered version and now I can't drag the hands anymore, but I can press S to make the pause go up. And I love how the shadows look there. Um, that's the cool thing you can do with those kind of 3D baked in animations. Um, D puts them together and then F does a little wave and I press it again to make it go back. So going behind the scenes, uh, we've got the drag version and the trigger version here. The trigger version has the A key attached to it. And if we go down to the triggers here, you'll see the key is A and we've got latch and hide others in group. So that will hide the dragger version and show the triggered version. And then um, for those animations like beg and hands together, you see it's just these sequences of layers uh, that they're just cycling through that they did in Lightwave, exported to Photoshop and uh, cycled, use cycle layers and key triggers to bring it all together here in Character Animator. So um, loving all the cool 3D work they're doing uh, with, with Character Animator and uh, this is another great uh, puppet and example from those guys. This was a really nice surprise. This is The Weather Girls, uh, created by Emily Watts, and uh, it's a short cartoon uh, about these three girls who are doing weather reports to their stuffed animals, and uh, in this episode they go out on the scene and uh, play Pokemon Go, but um, this was her first time using Character Animator and After Effects. Uh, she definitely has some illustration skills, the character design is great, but um, animation had been something she hadn't really tackled before, so uh, I'm sure there's some other people in the same boat as her, so I I asked her to share her advice for other people who may want to make their own cartoons and are just getting started with these programs. So here's what she wrote me. She said, number one, don't worry about learning the whole program before getting started. There are way too many menus, buttons, and settings to try to learn the entire interface before you start creating. You'll just get overwhelmed. So I avoided any kind of comprehensive training programs and instead started with OK Samurai's making your first character tutorial. Oh, thanks a lot. As a beginner, just ignore any buttons or settings you see in the program until you actually come upon a need for a new capability and then you can find out where that's done in Character Animator or After Effects. In the meantime, the default settings on anything you don't understand will be just fine. And then number two, start with one of the sample puppets. Even though I drew new artwork in every layer in the Wilk puppet I started with, it made a huge difference to start with Wilk. That's the green character that's in that making your first character tutorial that she mentioned earlier. Uh, not only do you have the file structure and naming conventions in place in the file already, but it also helps to see exactly what size, position, and style of illustration is in each layer, as opposed to starting with a blank template with the file structure. And that way, when my own puppets did some funky things in Character Animator, I could open Wilk and see what was set differently, and it gave me a very close comparison between puppets to troubleshoot. So just start with the same puppet that seems to have the closest body type to the character you have in mind, and go from there. 
And then number three, the more OK Samurai tutorials on YouTube you watch, the better. You'll really build up your knowledge and skills extremely quickly with each one. I learned so many things every time. And I, I promise I did not pay her to say that, but thank you very much. And I'm glad they're helpful. Um, that's why I make them. So uh, anyway, congratulations, Emily. This is fantastic. Uh, my kids watched it and they were laughing and enjoying it a lot. So uh, I think you've, you've, uh, you're onto something great here. So hope to see more episodes in the future. And uh, thanks so much for sharing. And finally today, this is 5-0 Antho. He is a uh, police officer who does video game streams on Twitch. And I asked him to talk a little bit more about his uh, puppet and kind of the process he goes through. So take it away. Hey, Dave. And hey, everyone. Thank you so much for having me this month, Dave. That's freaking, freaking awesome. I'm super, super honored. Let me just introduce myself really quickly. My name is 5-0 Antho. I'm a streamer on Twitch. I live stream video games and share some of my juicy, juicy work stories. Hold on, let me throw on my glasses really quickly. Uh, that's better. Um, I was created by my, my partner, Anthony, who's a real life police officer here in Northern California. And my good, good, very good friend, Scott, over at Look at Creative Studio. Freaking awesome, awesome human being. Um, the reason I was created was because I wanted to reunite the community with police officers Lately, there's been a huge separation and I wanted to share, you know, my knowledge, my love for video games and for animation with the community in order to bring them back together. And it's been working so far. It's been pretty awesome. You know, I was given this gun, although it doesn't really shoot real bullets. Yeah, well, you, you get the point. You get the point. Just a little bit about my setup here. I use a Lenovo touchpad um, computer. I think it's like Lenovo Yoga, um, and it allows me to drag multiple drag points at the same time. And I love that I can do that. It just makes animating this character so much more fun. I use a Elgato HD60S to capture everything on this card. I have a uh, on this computer, I have a green screen that's behind me and I, I chroma key the green screen out via OBS before it gets uh, streamed onto Twitch. Plugged into my Lenovo, I, I also have a separate microphone. It's a lapel mic, so it, it's attached to my shirt. And I found that if I have that microphone along with the microphone that you're hearing me on, so I use two microphones, the mouth movements are a little bit better. It's It picks up my, my mouth movement or the sounds a little bit better. So the mouth shapes are more pronounced. I also use foot pedals um, to activate some of my main facial expressions that I use on my stream. Um, I got this idea from Scribbly and it was an awesome, awesome idea. For example, you already saw the crying eyes one. If I get killed or something in a game, I hit my crying. But if I love something that somebody says, then I hit my love eyes, my glasses disappear. And then um, whenever I get an alert of, uh, of a follow or you know a donation or something like that, I hit this one, which is my favorite, and my eyes turn into little sirens or whatnot. I really appreciate you having me, Dave. Anybody wants to, any question or has any questions or anything like that, feel free to ask. Quick tips. So when you first bring a character into Character Animator, you probably notice how it swivels around and its legs are not fixed to the ground. And the way we've said this in the past tu for tutorials is select your body group, find this little thumbtack tool down here, um, and just add a couple of fixed handles down there. But something to note is that these, uh, these three down here, fixed and draggable and dangle, all of these are are shortcuts to creating a blank handle with a tag associated with it. So see this little circle that you've probably never used before over here? This is the handle tool. And what this does is allow you to create a blank handle anywhere and then you can tag it. So if I tag a blank handle with fixed, that's the exact same thing as using this little thumbtack tool. So for example, let me undo several of these steps. Um, one thing I could do, instead of adding two or three fixed handles, another way to go about it is I could drag and add a stick down here instead and then tag that as fixed. And what that's going to do, if I go back to my scene, now his feet are not only uh, you know have a stick going through them so they'll stay uh, stationary um, and, and not get warping, but they're also fixed to the ground and that stick is going to stay in place as if it was just you know uh, a metal rod going through it uh, that's just staying still that's attaching him to the ground there. 
So as another option, actually, if I took uh, this stick out, and then instead, at my top level character, I tagged him as draggable, now look what happens. Now I can drag and move my character around. And it's kind of funny because this tie is swooshing all over the place. Um, but that's another way. You can tag groups and layers and whole characters and things like that. So it's worth experimenting with this stuff. Uh, try tagging different elements or handles in your character and you might get some pretty cool results. When I first started out with Character Animator, when I wanted to record arm movements, my character was always constantly flailing their arms all over the place, and uh, just because I could. And turns out that doesn't look that great. Um, what professional animators know is that you want to do more of a pose-to-pose -pose type workflow. So your character is doing this, or this, or this, or they are accentuating certain things they're saying with their hands and their arms. So. Uh, in Character Animator, here's how I would go about doing that sort of thing. So this character is set up correctly. He's got his arms in kind of an A position, and that's what we recommend as the default pose for your character in your PSD or AI file to get the maximum flexibility. But um, we don't want our character probably looking like an airplane the entire time. So let's set a default rest pose for our character. So let's go to the puppet panel, and with this top level selected, I'm gonna go over to my behaviors and add a second dragger behavior. Now, I'm gonna do this because I wanna see the right recording while I'm doing the left arm recording. You don't have to do this step, but if you're recording individual arms, I'd say it's worth taking this extra step. So, I'm gonna make sure that my first, only my first dragger is armed with the little red dot next to it, and I'm gonna set that, make sure that's set to hold in place. And then I'm just gonna set this arm in this position right here on the hip, because I want that to be my default rest pose. I'm gonna record for one second and stop. And then let's move back to the beginning, disarm that dragger, arm the second dragger, and this will be for my left arm, uh, the character's left arm, set that in a rest position. Oh, make sure first that I've set that to hold in place, set that to a rest position, record for one second, and stop. And now if I disarm that, I can extend these takes by dragging over the edge, get that little uh, horizontal arrow icon, and then just drag it so it extends the take for the entire duration. And so now, if I play this back, my character is going to always have their hands on their hips. And uh, I've just extended that one second take to serve as my default pose for the entire duration of this performance. Now what I can do from that is uh, listen to the talk track and have the character move from that uh, rest position into particular uh, arm movements. So I might gesture for, for example, here, let's arm one of the arms, uh, the right arm, and I'm just gonna have him kind of move his arm a few times like this. I'm gonna set the recording speed to half speed um, to just really get that fluid recording and press record and do this sort of thing and then hold down record there, uh, and then I'm just gonna use the blend handles here to blend that performance so it looks a little bit nicer. Let's see, uh, let me disarm dragger, and let's see how that looks. Okay, so that looks pretty good. You know, you could fine tune it, but overall that's looking pretty nice. Now let's say I wanted the character to point at one part um, with his other arm, and so what I could do here is maybe I have something like this where I want his arm to extend out. So let's record just for a second or two here. Okay, that looks pretty good. And then let me zoom in a little bit so I can see these blend handles. And I just wanna blend that performance a little bit. Um, and so it should blend, uh, let's disarm this. It should blend from the rest position to the point and back, and that's a very quick gesture. Notice how qu quickly that went. Um, I was recording in slow motion, and then I did a really quick blend uh, there as well. Now, to do the actual point, I've got a keyboard trigger here, so let's arm keyboard triggers, and if I press the six, that's how he does a point. But it looks really jittery if I just swap the hand like this. So I kinda wanna hide that transition when the arm is actually moving uh, in, its, in its motion. So uh, I'm gonna do really super slow-mo recording here and go to quarter speed and let's see if I can hide that keyboard trigger um, with the arm moving. And so my timing wasn't that great. Um, I think I came in a little late, but that's okay. Let's see when I actually brought that keyboard trigger in.
Okay, so it was right there when it came in. So let's actually disarm keyboard triggers and let's just trim to exactly that position and that's when it comes in. And instead, let's have it, when's the arm coming up here? Right about there, let's have that be when the point takes over. And that's gonna hide it a little bit more. Let's see how this looks now. Okay, so that was a little bit fast. I mean, it's a pretty fast gesture, but it looks, it looks pretty nice. So that's my general recommendation. If you're doing arm movements, listen to what your character's saying. Think about, take notes about when are those moments when I want my character to express something or what could I do here? Should I have them point? Should I have them gesture? Should I have hands on the hips? Rise in the air, whatever you think, and uh, then record these little blended performances over top of your default rest pose, and that should get you pretty nice results. All right, last tip for today, adding a shadow in After Effects. So there are ways to add shadows in Character Animator, but if you want your shadow moving and doing all the things your character is doing, you're essentially gonna have to run two versions of your puppet over top of each other, and then uh, that's gonna lead to performance and you know uh, speed issues. So what I recommend for a recorded piece, at least, is doing this stuff in After Effects. So I took the background that I had uh, in, in this scene off, and I just want to take my character and then I made a new composition here in After Effects that has that scene, uh, this, this kind of sidewalk scene. And I'm just going to drag my scene from a Character Animator into After Effects and it's just going to show up uh, right here it looks like. And then all I have to do is just drag this scene on top of here and my character is now a composition, a new scene that I can move around in this uh, environment. And immediately, I'm just gonna duplicate that by pressing Command D on Mac, that's Control D on Windows. And with the bottom layer, I'm just gonna move that out for a second and then go to Effect uh, and Color Correction. And I'm gonna go to Curves. There's so many different ways to do this, but uh, I'm just gonna bring the curves all the way down to like that, uh, just drag on it. And then I'm going to go to Effects Obsolete Fast Blur and uh, I'm not sure why it's obsolete, but I like it. And I'm just gonna blur that a little bit, bring the blur up to 14 or something like that. And then you can decide what to do with that uh, shadow. So let's say the character was in front of this house uh, you know, while he was talking. So I could do something like this, where it's showing uh, behind him. And I can of course press uh, select that shadow, press T to bring up opacity and bring that down so it's not as, uh, not as dark, it's a little bit more subtle. And then I would want to connect it to my character by using this little pick whip thing here and connecting it to my main character. That way whenever I move my character, the shadow is gonna move with it instead of leaving it behind. So that's one way to do it. Um, of course, if he's walking down the sidewalk, eventually he's gonna reach a point where that shadow doesn't really make sense to be on the mountains behind him. So probably what makes more sense in this scene is to take that shadow and just basically reverse it and do something like this underneath him. And now that that's attached to him, if I move my character back and forth, uh, you know, or he's just, even if he's just standing still. And so now with this shadow, um, you can see he feels like he's more connected to this world, part of this scene. Um, and it's a little bit dark still. I'd probably bring it down even more. Um, you don't have to go overboard with this sort of thing. Just something that helps connect him to the environment a little bit better. Um, and I think that's a really nice touch that, that helps add a little bit of extra uh, dimensionality to your scenes. So if you've ever used Character Animator around a kid, uh, it, they always want to come up and start playing with it and make goofy faces and voices and play around with the character. Right, Cameron? Mm -hmm. You like doing that? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So Cameron's five years old and he's going to help me show today one process, one way that you can get kids to create their own animated characters pretty easily. Um, we're just going to do a basic template like this, uh, a character where they create a character and a few different mouse shapes and by doing that, we'll be able to then take it into Photoshop, cut out the different parts, and then give them a character that you can actually animate that you've created on your own. Does that sound like fun? Yeah. You sound really enthusiastic about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yes. Okay, let's get started. Cameron, the first thing you're going to do is you wanna make a face with all these different parts. So you need a face with a background, two eyeballs with pupils in the middle, Pupils are like the little things in the middle right there. Uh, eyebrows that go on top, a nose, and then a straight kind of basic mouth, okay? Do you think you can do that on this piece of paper? And I made just this spiky haired guy, but you can make a monster or an alien or a ghost or a skeleton, whatever you want, okay? 
So the best thing to do, I think if you can draw a guide and have them copy it, kind of have that as a template, um, that serves as a great starting point and they'll just kind of use that, but then do their own thing. Okay, great. Now, below, I drew four different mouth shapes, a smile, an open mouth with teeth and a tongue, an O mouth, and then a mouth with the teeth clenched together. Can you do the same under your monster? Okay. Okay, awesome. Now, do you want to color any more of it? Like, do a little bit more in yeah, his head or stuff? Color. Okay. So why don't you do a little bit of coloring with some of the other crayons? His name is Poofy. His name is Poofy? Yeah. I like it. This part's going to be yellow, and this part's going to be red. Wow. And that guy's name is Poofy? Yeah. Okay. Should uh, I draw his name? Sure. There it is. Looks good, Poofy. So Cameron made Poofy, and we took a picture of him using our uh, phone, and then I brought that file into Photoshop, and now we're going to just do a little bit of surgery to take the different parts off and organize them correctly for Character Animator, okay? All right, so let's get started. All right, so we got our buddy Poofy here, and uh, the first thing I always want to do is change the levels. So that's Command L is the shortcut on uh, on Mac, and then you can bring the darks up a little bit and the lights up a little bit, and that's just going to make the contrast a little bit nicer, um, and I think just get you better results overall. So that looks pretty good, just doing it like that. First thing I'm, I usually do is take the polygonal lasso tool up here, um, and I'm just going to cut out each individual piece and start to put them together. So here is the background head, and we'll cut that out and then we'll paste it back on as its own layer and we'll call that BG for background. Here's the O mouth. I know that I'm going to call that Woo later so I will do that correctly but don't worry about all the naming stuff exactly right now. We can tag stuff later in Character Animator, not a big deal. All right, so now that I've got all my individual pieces, I'm just gonna delete this background and now I've kind of got the basic working parts. Now, the toughest part is going to be taking things out of this uh, guy right here. And so I need to take the eyes out, the pupils, um, and the neutral mouth. So the way I'm gonna do that is actually do the same uh, polygon tool, a uh, lasso tool, but I'm not going to, I'm just gonna copy and paste these ones. So I should leave the underlined one below and leave this here um, and have a neutral mouth. So the reason I'm doing that is because I'm gonna clone stamp out the parts that we don't need later on. So I've now separated out all these parts. I had, you know, all, all the original separated parts and then I had to, with the lasso tool, take out the, uh, um, the eyeballs and the pupils and the eyebrows and the neutral mouth. So the next step is on this background layer, I'm going to use the clone stamp tool, this little stamp icon over here. And I'm gonna make it pretty big and maybe a brush that's, you know, something like this that's going to get a lot of space around it. And then what I do is hold oh, down nice. Option. Look what I do, Cameron. I hold down Option to get part, and then I clone stamp over top of another part. So Option to take a sample, and then click to put it down. And so what I'm doing is essentially erasing what you had there already. We want to, And I'm gonna make the brush size bigger to take out these eyeballs, for example. So let's do something like this. And I still have his picture so I can kind of reference where all these are going to go. But something There's like no that. Eyeball. Yeah, what happened to his eyeballs? Well, don't worry, we're gonna put them back in in a second, so. And the eyeballs and stuff are gonna go over top of this, so it's okay if it's a little bit blurry. Um, don't worry about that too much. It's, it's not that big of a deal. I need to do the same thing with the eyeballs um, because I wanna make sure, because I want the pupils to move inside the eyeballs. Next thing is we have to get rid of all this extra stuff around the side. Um, and so the way I'm gonna do that is the magic wand tool and usually the first pass will get you pretty close to it. I'm just gonna press it in the area, click in the area that I don't want. Um, so maybe something like that. That's looking pretty good um, overall. And then I'll go in with the, uh, a lot of times I'll just go in with the eraser cause you're gonna get these jagged sections like down here. And I'll just go in with the eraser and erase the areas um, that aren't aren't doing too hot. 
or you could just manually erase uh, you know, a lot of the edges yourself. Magic Wand I'll usually use to start and then refine those edges okay. with the eraser. Not so if good. it looks like there's extra stuff around this woo shape, I'm just going to do like that. Okay, so now thanks to the magic wand and the eraser tool, I've got all my parts as individual pieces. And now we can start lining them up together. Here's my left eye, and I'm gonna do that on the character's left side of the screen, and the right eye on the character's right. And I can kind of see where those were before. And this guy kind of has angry eyebrows, so that's kind of cool. I'll drag those in and each pupil. I like to keep the pupils in the middle as a best default position. Do you have the hiccups? Yeah. And then I'm going to line up the different mouths. So here's an E mouth. I'm gonna make sure all these mouths are in front of the background. <laughs> so here's the E mouth. That looks pretty good. Let's resize this using free transform. Now I can start organizing things in character animator. So first thing I'm gonna do is crop this. And let's make sure the image size is something manageable. That feels a little too big to me. I'm gonna change the width to a thousand instead. <laughs> that looks that looks a little bit better to me. Now I can start making my folders. So I always do, luckily we're just doing a head right now. So I made a plus character name folder here and the head. I'm gonna put all these different things inside the head group. The minimum that I think you want for the mouth is neutral, Woo, which is W dash O O, A ah, A H, and E E. This will give you a lot of those major vowel sounds. <laughs> so, one nice thing about Character Animator is that you don't need all the different mouth shapes. You can actually just use, uh, you know, these five that I've got here. And as long as you got some basic vowel sounds, woo, ah, I, that stuff, there's actually a fallback mechanism. So if it can't find, if it hears a D or an S sound and it can't find it, it's gonna fall back to one of those sounds. Um, so the more you put in these, the better your lip sync's gonna look, but kids don't typically have the patience to draw all 14 mouth shapes. So I kept it pretty simple here. So there you have it. There's a basic group structure. I've got my main plus character group name, plus Poofy. He's got a head group inside of that, which means it'll move with my head and character animator. I've got my two eyebrows, plus left eyebrow and plus right eyebrow. I've got my right eye group, which includes the plus right pupil and the right eyeball. And then my left eye group, which is the same thing on the left side. I've got this extra group, I don't know why that's there. Uh, my mouth, which has a smile, a neutral, a woo, an ah, and an E, and then my background layer. <laughs> That's pretty funny when it does that, huh? <laughs> All right, so let's save this. Okay, do that, do you that. Want... Oh, where's my head going? Where, where's his nose too? Time to save this and bring Poofy into Character Animator. All right, so now we're in Character Animator and <laughs> let's import by going to File, Import. Poofy's somewhere around here, here he is, import him. And that's how he looks in the puppet panel. That's looking pretty good to me. So let's now add him to a new scene. Now I didn't add a blink layer and because I didn't do that, the eyes are doing this weird, uh, when I blink, it's doing this weird warping thing. So the first thing I wanna do is go to face and turn eyelid strength down all the way to zero. And that's gonna prevent that from happening. All right, Cameron, your turn to take over. Hello, I'm Poofy. I'm really spiky. But I, my, my name is Poofy. I am big. I am big and small. <laughs> <laughs> so Cameron, try raising your eyebrows. Good job. Try smiling. <laughs> try looking around to the left and the right. What did he do? Oh, just with your face forward, look to the left with your eyes. Just look to the left and right. Nice. And it's just me with a few final notes. Uh, first off, Cameron wanted me to add buttons, uh, meaning key triggers afterwards. So of course, A makes him turn rainbow face, Y makes him completely disappear, and seven gives him an extra eye. Um, so adding little fun, silly things like that is, is a lot of fun for, for kids as well. 
Also, the way that I did things was just one way to do it. And if you're not comfortable with stuff like clone stamping and all that, there's a lot of other ways to do it. If you had kids cut out each individual part, so cut out a background, cut out eyeballs and pupils and eyebrows and mouths, and then you know with scissors cut those out, put them on a solid background like a you know a green screen type background or or just something that's very easy to cut out with the magic wand, and then that might make it easier to slice individual pieces uh, together. Or if they make something out of play doh or uh, you know any other kind of medium, uh, you could separate parts and put them together in Photoshop that way. Basically, there's no really wrong way to do that. Um, you know, to do this, this was one technique that I did that worked well, and I like that he was able to just draw the character as one piece, and then I did more of the hard work, and it was on me to do. Um, but you know, whatever you think is going to work best uh, for uh, you know whichever kid you're working with. Um, probably makes sense and the end result you know having this talking moving monster that they're controlling with their voice that they made uh, is is a very cool thing to see so hopefully that's helpful and uh, if you uh, if you have kids that make any cool stuff please send it our way we would love to see it one of the most common requests uh, that I've seen in the YouTube comments are people asking me to do a drawing tutorial um, now there's a ton of drawing uh, tutorials out there on YouTube and uh, people who are way, way, way more talented than me uh, doing this sort of thing. But here's my perspective on things and how I go about it in case that's helpful, uh, th my process. So uh, first thing is you've got to get something to, if you're serious about digital illustration, you've got to have some way to get your drawings onto the computer. For me, that's a Wacom Intuos, uh, this is an Intuos 3, I think 6x8. I've had this for about 10 years, it works really well. Um, I've got a newer version uh, at the San Jose office where I normally work, but um, this is a fantastic tool. And uh, you know, whether it's this or an iPad Pro or Surface or Cintiq if you can afford it, that sort of stuff, just something that you can draw and get your stuff, your ideas onto a digital canvas. Uh, if you've ever tried drawing or illustrating with a mouse before, you know how tedious and difficult that can be. Um, so if you have any interest, it's definitely worth an investment to get one of these types of tools. The more you draw, the better and more refined your skill set will get. Um, for me, I did a uh, comic strip in college, uh, and so it, it was called Second Nature, and it was for a daily college newspaper. And so five days a week, I was forced to draw an attempt to be funny uh, on a daily basis um, and create these characters. And if I look back on the very first things I drew, uh, the very first comics that I drew versus where I was four years later, um, the changes in style were just, uh, you know, I just became more refined. I understood, uh, you know, I got the process a little bit more. I got better at drawing. Um, my, my lines became cleaner. My uh, composition became better. I got better at shading, uh, um, lettering, all of that stuff. So just the more you do it in practice. So, you know, if you can find that sort of thing that forces you to draw on a daily basis, whether that's school projects or, uh, you know, an online, you know, thing you post on Instagram every day or whatever you can do, the more you can practice with illustration, uh, the better you will get. And I am by no means a professional. I, this is a hobby thing for me still. I don't consider myself a professional animator by any, or illustrator by any stretch of the ima imagination. Um, I, but I enjoy it. I love it. And I feel like I do get better every, a little bit better every time I, uh, I draw another character. And I've learned a lot from emulating other styles. When I was doing that comic strip, uh, I was heavily influenced by Calvin and Hobbes by Bill Watterson. And I would just practice drawing, like how he drew, drew trees. Uh, I would practice just emulating and looking at a comic strip and just trying to draw a tree exactly like he did it. And just how he did the shading and the cross hatching, the leaves and all that stuff. So find those things out there you're, you're passionate about and you want to, uh, you know, you want to learn from. So artists that you really enjoy, uh, comic books or uh, art that you find uh, from online artists and uh, take those and try to learn from how they do things. Pay close attention to how they do shadows and highlights and color and their lines uh, and all that stuff. And uh, by emulating them, you don't have to exactly copy them, right? And that all your artwork is going to look like someone else's art, but you'll learn from their techniques and then you can take what you've learned and uh, make it influence your own style. And then you've got your own unique style uh, that's a mix of, okay, I took this thing. I, I can specifically remember 
the things that I've taken from Calvin and Hobbes, the things I took from drawing Mario and Yoshi and when the Super Nintendo came out and, and Zelda and Link and all that stuff. Um, I remember Nickelodeon cartoons and trying to emulate drawing those. I can pick specific things of here's how I ha learned how to draw eyes and noses. Here's how I learned how to draw hair. Here's how I learned how to draw trees and uh, kind of mix that all together. So bottom line, if you're starting to develop your own style and you're trying to learn more and get started with digital illustration, that's my advice is practice. Practice with the things and the styles that you like the most, that inspire you the most, and try to learn from them. And uh, eventually, uh, you know, you'll develop your own voice and style that's a mashup of all those different things that you've practiced with. Okay, so we're here in Photoshop. I'm gonna add a new layer. Actually, the first thing I'll do a lot of times is make my background a uh, kind of a light gray color. That way I'm gonna see white when it shows up. Um, and you know, a lot of times if the white of the eyeballs or stuff like that, I wanna make sure that I can differentiate that from the background. And then I'll start off with a brush uh, and I'm just using some basic uh, brushes now, but of course you can download all sorts of cool brushes uh, online for Photoshop. And then I'll draw a basic outline, a really rough draft of how I want my character to look. So I'm gonna draw a bird this time. So I'm just doing some really rough ideas of how this bird would look. So that's where his eyes would be. Really, really rough. You just wanna kinda of get the proportions of what you're looking at um, and how things are going to play out. So we'll start with that and then I'll bring the opacity way, way down on that. So something like, you know, this is at around 15% or something like that. And then I'll start going over and I'll zoom in so I've got a little bit more control over my line quality um, as I'm moving around. If you're too zoomed out, then uh, your lines will look a little bit more jittery. Uh, so for me, I zoom in and I like kind of the rougher line art style so I you know if you want to be really smooth you could use the pen tool or something like that but my particular style and look is is a little bit more um, of kind of a hand sketched look so I just go around the basic idea and structure of my character and I'll just make these lines going around now for character animator um, the more that I can separate parts the better right so I know that the eyes are gonna be a separate element so I'm gonna make sure I'm gonna make a folder here just call it I for now and uh, place a layer in there and start to worry about, you know, here's an I that I'm going to worry about later. Same thing with the beak. I would probably want to do, you know, a nutcracker jaw or something like that to it. So I'm going to separate those parts, particularly this early stage, separate it into as many layers as you can and then worry about flattening them uh, later on. And with the wings, I know that I probably want them to like be hidden and pivot behind the character. So I'm actually gonna go through it and kind of make it a little extra because I know like right about here is where I'm gonna want that pivot point to be where they attach, where they staple uh, to, the, to the bird, uh, to the body. So I'll make sure I can make little marks like that because I know I'll be kind of hiding this behind the rest of the body. Okay, so all I've done is kind of given this guy some basic texture and if I take the background out um, my initial rough drawing, I can see what I've done. Now, here, I'm not really liking how wide his head is looking. It's kind of looking a little bit too um, too wide for my taste and too fat. So I'm just going to select all those layers and press Command-T on Mac to get to free transform, and then just bring it in a little bit to be a little narrower and move it around. And a lot of times with all these individual parts, I'll, I'll do this sort of thing where I, I bring things around and resize them. I have a tendency to always make my heads way too big uh, and lopsided. Um, so a lot of times I'll, you know, I'll have to resize those and bring them down. So I've turned that guide layer completely off and now I'm going to move into some flat painting. Um, so let's go behind the body layer now and I'll just add something behind that and let's just make this bird blue, let's say. So I'm gonna pick a color here and I'll pick a thicker brush and I'm just drawing beneath that layer and filling it in. And to get to certain layers, I might hide other layers just so I can get to them. And a lot of times I'll kind of do the middle and, uh, and then move to a finer, a finer brush um, just to get the edges there. And you could magic wand these and uh, do it that way too. I just, I enjoy the, the more control that I get over um, painting like this and it doesn't take too long to do. All right, so now I've done the flat color pass and uh, kind of got a, a basic outline and color idea of what I want with the character. 
And then really it comes down to details. Um, and I have this thing that I almost always do with all my characters, which is just a really small, I'll take a one or a two brush uh, sized brush and just do a texturing over everything. So I'll do a layer of just little circles and dots and texturing um, to give it a little bit more definition. And I might do several layers of these uh, at different opacities. So, you know, here's, here's some white uh, that I did and I'm gonna bring that down to, you know, something like, let's see, 17%, barely see it, but still there's a little bit of definition. And I'll do the same thing with black. So these little shadows and highlights that I'm adding into the character to give it this, a little bit of extra dimension and character and not feel as flat. Now at this stage, I'm starting to get into more detail with each of these parts. So now is probably a good time for me to uh, start naming and identifying what these, these different parts are instead of layer 372 and remembering that that's the you know beak or something like that. I'm gonna go ahead and start naming these things to know uh, exactly what they are for, for later. So if I take a look at my character now, I just have all these groups of parts and in each, inside each one, is uh, you know the line art and then the different textures that I've done and then the coloring. And so this allows me to section off each piece and be able to start attacking things individually. So next thing I'll do is worry about shading. So I'll just draw in each group, I'll draw black and just kind of draw on one side, kind of where if the light source was on one side, draw shadow on the other side. And then I'll bring that opacity down to something like 35, 36, that looks pretty good. And just continue that process for each piece, drawing black and bringing the opacity down. Behind the eyes, I might add some black just to give them a little bit more definition, uh, make them stand out a little bit more, and then bring the opacity down there too. All right, so now I've got the shadows uh, at a pretty good spot where I like them. And now I'm gonna think about, uh, I'm gonna add some highlights to the body here. So the, the, the belly of this, uh, of this bird, I kind of want to be a little bit brighter. So I'm gonna draw just kind of a whitest section here. And I might fool around with the blend modes at this stage just to see if there's something look good. Overlay is my usual go-to. That's looking pretty good. And I'll bring the opacity down. And there he's got a kind of a little belly now that adds a little bit of extra definition to him. And then I start to think about the texture at this point, so um, the bird, for example, probably has uh, you know kind of this this feathery uh, style to it, and so I might do kind of a I'll do this with hair a lot too, where I'll just kind of stroke and do some overlay of you know these hair-like motions and kind of work with the contours of what I'm uh, whatever shape I'm drawing inside. So in this case, I'm kind of drawing and curving within the the confines of this body piece. And then I'll bring the opacity down with that as well. But even that little, those little marks start to make it feel a little bit furrier, give it a little bit more uh, of, a, of a textured feel. Another thing I'd really like to do is play around with colors and just try to blend some things that, you know, you feel might go with your character. So for example, this blue, maybe I wanna try kind of a, a lighter orangish color um, and blend that in and see how that looks uh, with this. So I might, you know, just draw these little marks. I might bring the brush up a little bit to give it a little bit of a texture. And then I may blur it um, a little bit to see, you know, something like that, and then bring the opacity down. And even that little color, it just, it, it makes it not as flat, right? So I'll, I'll play around and kind of add that same idea in other parts of the character, maybe in, you know, kind of highlight area. And then one of the last things I like to do is use a uh, use like a wet brush or a watercolor style brush to add some additional final texture. And you can add new brushes, by the way. If you're bringing your brushes panel in Photoshop, this little icon lets you see all these different brushes. And wet media brushes are particularly nice. Um, there's some watercolor brushes that I really like. So this is one of the wet media brushes and it gives you kind of this nice watercolor type feel. Um, and again, there's tons of brushes out there that you can um, look for. Uh, but I like playing with this just because it gives it a nice painterly texture. And I'll play around with the size. I might even bring the opacity of the brush down a little bit as I'm doing it. Um, and just kind of speckle 
and give some, some more texture on the sides. So here's kind of the more shadowy area of the head and I'll bring that down and add texture there. And then I'll do the same thing with white. Uh, one other thing I find, the actual line art I find, but bringing it down to lower values, that kind of makes it blend in a little bit nicer. And by the end of it, it, it makes it, uh, you know, not feel as dark. So after a while, I eventually end up with something like this. Uh, and it's just, you know, the end result of adding a ton of different layers and textures and highlights and shadows and little details and flourishes uh, to the character. And, you know, it's hard to know when to stop uh, because you can keep adding more and more stuff on top of a character. Um, but for now, I'm liking how this guy is looking. Um, you know, sometimes I'll play with the saturation. I actually made the whole character a little bit more narrow. Uh, by selecting him and free transforming him to be, you know, a little bit smaller um, like that. And so you can fool around with, with that sort of thing if you want. Um, playing with the saturation, playing with, um, you know, little details and, and things like these little uh, ridges in his feet or these little black shadows that happen behind him, a uh, tail, uh, you know, all sorts of little things like that. The beak has a little bit of orange on one side uh, to kind of give it a little bit more dimension. Um, so just keep adding and trying things and having fun with it and layering. I mean, this guy has, you know, well over a hundred layers now to him. Um, and eventually before I bring him into character animator, I'll want to flatten all of those out. I'll save a cop master copy of him at full resolution and full layers, but then I'll save a character animator specific version of all the parts flattened out and organized and named in the correct way uh, so I can animate them. But that is a quick look at uh, how I draw things. And I hope that's helpful for you. Uh, drawing your own creations. All right, that's it for this episode. Thank you very much for watching. And if you find yourself in Las Vegas at the end of this month, please stop by the NAB conference. Adobe will have a booth there. Character Animator will have a demo station in the back. And I'll be doing a live demo on stage once a day, uh, Monday through Thursday. And I'll be around too, so uh, the, the show floor. So please, if you're going to be there, please stop by, say hi, tell us how you're using Character Animator. Uh, we'd love to see you there. Otherwise, if you have any questions, t uh, concerns, issues you're running into, all that stuff, head to the official Character Animator forums where myself or someone else from the team will try to help you out and answer all your questions. But that's it for this month. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Have fun.